Okay, so today's July 4th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderat Extension ID. Um, so I think I hear an echo. Does everyone want to start off with a discussion, um, a debrief on the interview with Dmitry Orlov? Um, does anyone have, anyone have questions or any ideas you want to start off with? Well, just happy Independence Day, by the way. Uh, if you're American, right. and, uh, <laughs> Thanksgiving, if you're English. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I thought that. Uh, I thought it was a nice interview, but I was surprised. I wasn't expecting that, and I didn't quite expect it to go there. But we, we were just talking earlier about how close it is to uh, Kevin McCann, and I hope that's not a keyword. Um, and yeah, the that kind of uh, far right thing, I noticed he kind of veered away from my questions about Christianity and his belief and stuff, but I get the, the idea that he is, uh, you know, probably Orthodox Christian. So, yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking about that, you know, here's, here's a, the thought I was thinking about, about that, you know, is that I was thinking about the unifying the left and the right. And the thought occurred to me that it's so easy well, uh, no, that's the wrong word to say. It's the kind of code I think for the right is Christianity. That that they are united. They're kind of a block, and on the left, everything's just fragmented, and everybody's you know riddled with identity politics. But it seems to me the the far right, in particular, they can take it as read that they are all Christians, and they seem united in a way that just doesn't <laughs> they speak the same language they don't they don't get factional like the left and i was i was wondering if you know if you united the left and the right you know say with an arg and a cult leader right um i would imagine you could um you know split the right down the lines of christianity because my thinking was that that you know the the if you want a cult leader like the uh, Lionel Schnell, if you saw that video, um, that the one about him being a cult leader, just basically putting it on, just pretending. If you were a kind of Andy Kaufman kind of cult leader like that, if you can pretend, say in America, you can go and do what he did and do you know like. Praise chaos. You basically be like a televangelist and an evangelical preacher. Um, just a spoof 
uh, about you know chaos magic and stuff. And I tell you, you you'll split them because half the people would go with it and say, no, it's just a funny flavor of Christianity, which is lots of funny flavors of Christianity in America, you know, from like shakers and the guys who hang, you know, handle snakes and the Mormons, which are complete, you know, Mormonism is, is a complete heresy. But Amer American Christians don't seem to know that. They think that, oh, you know, Mormonism is a flavor of Christianity. <laughs> it's the worst heresy you've ever heard of. Uh, but so, so I think that some people would get it if you just put on an act and you did that kind of preacher and then you did one where you do, you know, kind of a holy Indian faker guy, you just do an Andy Kaufman. You know, most of the people know that it's kind of a joke and it's kind of a thing. Some of the guys would get into it, but I think you would split the right because some people would say, no, this guy's making a mockery of Christianity. This, you know, this guy's a Satanist. And the other guys would say, no, no, it's it's Christian. It's okay. And you would split the right smack down the middle, wouldn't you? Which I think would be a very beneficial thing. I kind of like the idea of uniting the left and splitting the right in one movement, right? Uh, because the, the right, nobody splits the right. The right is just homogeneous, right? But I think that would do it, don't you? Yeah, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. It's, it's kind of like social is something that, you know you, you could get you could get you, you know a lot of people you could get to, to sing you know like social brian cohen was singing you know, he, he told all these guys that the, the national anthem of kazakhstan is you know throw the jew down the well and stuff and he gets a whole bar in texas to sing you know throw the jew down the well and they don't they don't think there's anything wrong with it you know? so it's so powerful to take on that comic role and just some guys would get it and you would cause controversy and some some guys you know you might run the risk of <laughs> some guy you know take, having a hit on you but in principle i kind of thought it's an excellent way to split the right which is kind of you know would be nice to do but how, how yeah. would you achieve that <laughs> well you would do exactly what the lionel schnell uh, video did you would say that you know you're the cult extinctionati, that and you're the cult leader, and you do this Andy Kaufman thing, and it keeps everybody guessing. It's like some people think, oh, it's genius, you know. It's some people think, oh, well, the cult leader's lost his mind. <laughs> it's like, what's the hell he's doing? So you know, so it's it's perfect for for an arg. But it, the thought occurred to me if you did that. You, you might unite the, the left because you wouldn't give them any handholds to, you know, any purchase on because it's just so damn confusing. Um, but the, you know, because you were doing behaving like an evangelical on the one hand and then maybe a guru, Indian guru on the other, and then maybe occasionally a Satanist just to spice, to spice it up. And some people would think, oh, this is genius, you're uniting all the religions. And then some people, you know, like flower children, Christian types, you know, like we know one of them, would, would be outraged and say, no, this is evil, it's, you know, satanic. But that would be great, I think. Yeah, yeah. I had another question about Dmitri because in, in the invitation, uh, the, and you you composed most of the invitation, Hugh. Um, we we engaged him on the idea of um, our philosophical views and uh, the arg, and those things were not really discussed with him. Do you think it's worth engaging with him again on this, or should we just shelve it and and leave him for the moment, you know, where he is and not and concentrate on faulty and other other works, uh, other interviews? Oh, well, I thought that we kind of exhausted it. I, I tried to leave it open to him and ask him, you know, do you have any questions for, from us? And he went like, nah. <laughs> so, okay, well, <laughs> where do you go with that? <laughs> I mean, I, he, he had no curiosity about us or where we were coming from or anything. It was just a, but, but I must say that, you know, he's, he's semi-famous. Semi uh, minor celebrity, 
let's say. And I've often found with those guys that uh, the more famous they are, the more egotistical they are, the more into themselves they are. And they couldn't give a continental fuck about you or the rest of the world or freaking anything. I mean, other than, you know, narcissistic supply and, you know, you adoring the NBA. And yeah, they'll, they'll steal a couple of ideas from you. But, you know, I, they never say like, but what about you? <laughs> They're not fascinated by anything other than themselves. And that's generally been my experience. I've been introduced to these, these guys that people say, oh, you know, this is so-and-so and he's so famous and stuff. And <laughs> every time I get introduced to them, I'm like, always goes down like a clanger because all they want to do is talk about themselves and you, you, they just want you to listen. And it they just get uh, boring after a while. There seemed to be an element of that with Alison too. Um, in the, I think in the last reply to Sophie where she finally refused to, to deal with us, I think she said something like, it's, it, it wasn't my style or it wouldn't suit my... As though she'd already not a good up. fit. Yeah, not a good fit. Yeah, not a good fit. That's right. That's what she said. Yes, and, and you could see that she already had an image of where she was at and how everything was to be approached, and that was it. It was a, a finished up product. Uh, and you know, please don't alter our design because we've just finished perfecting it and all this kind of thing. You know. So. Well, these guys are all cult leaders. I mean, all of them are minor cult leaders. And what they what they're saying is, I I took a long time to come up with this philosophy of life, and I have my little groupies, and they all, you know, we all in this echo chamber together. We all reflect off each other, and that's you know that's my shtick. And so there are very few people that have a, a bigger goal. And so the, you know the reason why I spent so long and waited with Faulty was to. For, for him to fall flat on his face because then then basically then he's listening and he's like yeah you know, finally somebody's go might ask a question like you know this isn't working how do we do that? <laughs> yeah hello <laughs> finally they're listening but in general yeah I find that they are cult leaders that are just you know self-absorbed they just have their little following and it's everybody from like Sam Mitchell to you know Guy McPherson and that they just look at um, this the comfort is, zone thing. Not going anywhere. They just they just yeah, the, the same old stuff. You know, it's just a mutual support group. But they all, they also seem to arrive at their own kind of comfort zone, uh, which just when you mentioned Sam Mitchell reminded me of that because I realised that with him after what, after tuning into him for a very long time that. He he didn't want his little, uh, not so much his ideas, but he didn't want his whole approach and his way of doing things disturbed either. It, it was just like, we got gone so far and I can do this amount of work and, um, you know, I don't want to be disturbed there. Uh, just, just look, I just want to carry on this way because it sort of runs itself and it's sort of, you're sort of semi-autopilot kind of thing. Um, I think that's also an issue with it. I think that um, I think that when we engage with Pierre and Derek, and to a certain extent uh, with uh, Max, well, I didn't have this feeling that I think that those guys had hadn't got a big ego and were ready to to cure, were really focused on the on the issue of of of, of nature of of our planet and they were not thinking so much about themselves and their followers they were they were deeply interested in what we were doing so maybe we should focus more on people who have not um who have that sort of agenda and who are real activists because really um alison is not an activist um she's a speaker she's a very brilliant speaker dmitri is i don't know what to define him and same with Kevin. Um, I don't know Sam Mitchell very well because I, I was never, I was never really, I, I could, I just couldn't. There was something I, I just never really liked his thing. So, you know, <laughs> but, you know, we, we have, mm. a, we had great interviews with Lear and, and, uh, and Derek and, and Max. And I think, um, we need to stay in touch with them. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, in all the, the guys, 
where we have a really bad hit rate, it's uh, it's always ego. So it's like Stephen Hazen and stuff like that. It, you know, there is endless like, okay, what do you want to interview me about? Let's see the questions. You know, basically, and then Guy McPherson would basically. I got into huge arguments with him because he made he wanted me to edit out the comments and only leave ones that were favorable to him. And I said, oh, no way I'm going to be editing out the comments <laughs> that are unfavorable to you. And he said, well, then I'm not going to do another interview. And I said, well, good luck then. <laughs> but he said that to, to everybody and he, he wound up falling off the interview circuit because <laughs> no one no one would edit the, you know, user comments to just pick out the ones that are favorable to his ego. So, but you always come up against these guys who have an ego and they're, you, they're useless. You can't really do anything with them. But then you come up with real activists that are, they're not, a, you know, they have zero ego. And then they, they're all about, you know, the bigger picture and nature and activism and stuff. So, it, yeah, I agree. I think, I think we should, we should read those guys out. But well, well, Max had agreed to to interact with with Faulty at some stage um, in a previous email about a couple of weeks ago. So I think we should keep that warm because if we engage yeah. Faulty soon, it could be very interesting to offer him uh, an opening into a, an activist in a camp, uh, really on the ground, who's doing some fantastic work. And I think it might warm up Faulty, you know. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, okay. Well, then maybe we should we should discuss uh, faulty then. So the um, so yeah. So the email I was going to propose that. Um, so okay, there were a couple of questions um, to get a critical mass points collective action in terms of getting concrete outcomes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the aim. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, well. Okay. Uh, these initial successful outcomes are critical to creating the credibility to create mass takeoff. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of tangential to the point, but yeah. I you see. Okay, this is the way I, I see it. And I, I, okay, let me test it on you and tell me if you agree. And then this is what we should say is that it's kind of thinking the, the wrong way around is what you're doing with an ARG slash cult is, is you, you are prepping the ground and waiting for your opportunity. You're not trying to get outcomes and you, 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 you know, I mean, okay, you've got an outcome, but the same as like, say a sword fighter or uh, you know a fencer has a, an outcome yes to win the fencing match but that doesn't mean that every stroke is like this is going to lead to a win you can't tell it's what you're doing is you're playing chess and you sure you can figure out the end game is to win but you can't say in advance we'll do this we're okay it's completely unhelpful to say like by the third move we must have captured five pieces. It's like, well, it was fucking retarded chess playing. You can't do that. But that's what, the problem with organizers. Yeah, yeah, you got to get out of that organizing mindset. Because what you're really trying to do is uh, you're trying to prepare people. So, so you do endless amounts of prepping and psychological prepping until the, the enemy makes a misstep. And then you take advantage of that mistake. So, for example, if your aim is to get 3,000 arrests, now the organizer thinks, well, what we'll do is in the autumn, we'll get, we've got 100 people that will get arrested. So, therefore, we'll do that, and that will impress people so much that then, you know, we'll set a target for the spring next year that we'll double it. And then we'll double it again, and we'll carry on doing it, and in three years we'll have 3,000. It's very unlikely to happen because... The first time you do a hundred, the other side is going to respond. They're not static. They, I mean, already look what happened in the UK, how the policing bill was a response to Extinction Rebellion. It was a direct response to their tactics. So their tactics were nullified in one year. And so the same is going to happen with the rest. 
they, they're going to look at it and they're going to try and ridicule you. They're going to try everything they can to make, you know, it's a very romantic idea. I completely get the idea that you get arrested and everybody goes, oh, look at that ded dedication. Oh, this guy's putting me to shame. I want to be part of that. You know, and you, you, you get everybody's gin up and you basically you know, get uh, everybody's juices flowing. And then they go and do crazy shit and get, you know, all become martyrs. But it can very easily be tipped the other way. Is you, you can get Pierce Morgan and stuff on the BBC to say, look at these ridiculous people and look at this. And he went to jail for 10 years. For what? For being a stupid, crusty idiot. And then basically you'll become a laughing stock. It'll go exactly the opposite way to the romantic thing. And then, you know, so you will see your numbers whittle down. It's kind of an all or nothing bet. But you see what, what you're doing in in terms of this more woo way, it's kind of arg way, is what you're doing is in the same situation, you would tell the, the members uh, that, you know, you would set up this expectation that we have this thing called the storm, like QAnon storm is perfect. You'd say there's the storm coming and then you would fetishize it and you would have everybody, you know, embellish it, train for it, practice it. The, the storm would eat, live and breathe the storm. And then you wait. At some stage, the government's going to fuck up. They, they're going to go to war or do a draft and very unpopular thing. And at that point, you say, now you, you flip the switch for the storm and everybody's ready. And then you get 3000 arrests in one fucking go. Then everybody's like, yes, get down there. Look, these people are 3,000 people are getting arrested. I'm in, I'm in. You know, they, you, but you, have, you can't step up to that. You have to it basically accept psychologically and not, you know, you can't actually, you know, it's, it's kind of like you can't beat Rome by saying, well, we'll take this foothill in, you know, in the, you know, this year, and then we'll advance to the Palatine, and then we'll move forward. It's like, no, we're never going to do that. So it's kind of retarded. But, but uh, yeah, so... You, yeah, so the thing, I think, there's a, a change of mindset. I, re I really have to get uh, Faulty out on the boat so I can, like, train him on this kind of basic uh, set of thinking. Because the only way I think I can break through, because it's such an entrenched uh, load of baggage. You know, it's just crap, crap that's just accretions of left-wing intellectual crap that is accreted on the left. And that's horseshit. It's all horseshit. So, you know, the yeah. idea that you can, say, get people to go and make these dramatic life-changing actions, like get arrested and ruin your little liberal life, have your parents, uh, you know, basically disown you for being, being a radical extremist. Uh, and then, you know, and people are supposed to do this for something as abstract as like 1.5 degrees in the climate change. No, no, can I, um, going to do that. they're going to do it maybe in like, you know, 2018 in April, because they have a bit of an eco anxiety, that eco anxiety is only going to last for one campaign, and then it's all gone, then you've got rid of your eco anxiety, and there's nothing left. So what, what, but what people will do, what history shows is that people will fucking do anything for a cult and a cult leader. So you have to develop the cult and the like minded mindset then you can basically unleash the cult members on anything you like. But you 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 know, if you have a look at the history of cults from like the Saren attack and, uh, you know, in, in Tokyo or like Oregon where Rajneesh and stuff, they poisoned a salad bar and stuff. I'm not saying we should do that stuff, but what it indicates is if you build up the cult, people are so loyal to the cult They'll do anything for the cult. So then you can use them for something like climate action. But that's but why I think, meantime, sorry, but it's, I think it's it, priming faulty now should be the, the, the priority because, okay, we can discuss his points, but getting him to go on the boat and, and starting to, 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 to prepare him as a cult leader or at the end of his email he, he's actually saying um he's saying um curious about the specifics of my role as prophetic leader i mean that could be a lead 
to to lure him more into maybe uh, going to, to 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 see you and and get him in the good stable all will be revealed and keeping a little um, bit you know i think you need to work on on getting him to to you yeah maybe um well well okay so let's just see that you all agree with my thinking on that second question because because my answer to that second question is really is asking like who makes the decision he asked like okay who decides the demand who negotiates and who calls off the collective action um and uh, we ensure this happens these are needed to enable the opposition to save face and create trust over, over reliability yeah so my answer to that is that that it's him he's jesus he's the cult leader and so you know it basically we we can advise and and stuff like that but we we might have influence but it's entirely up to him the reason why the left doesn't work is this obsession with collective action and it never works because there's no way a group of crusty lefties are going to defeat a government they you you cannot get consensus and so it's useless to try and get collective action it's better to just do the cult and you say like we're not doing this you know we're not doing climate change in it it's just a fucking game then everybody plays the game and then basically faulty there's like a general in an army so you know it was so like a field marshal so as a field marshal you can you can um excuse the mosquitoes yeah the as a field marshal you can refer to your generals and stuff and take input but eventually you have to come up with a plan and it can only be an individual because uh, you can only get genius out of an individual so yeah Thank you can't you. get genius out of a committee it just does, it doesn't fucking work that way and so the left's got to get over the stupid thing you why have consensus because consensus means that you 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 value consensus more than victory so it is like really i think that the climate change and human extinction is fuck more important than than your fucking mor morals and ethics and you know things that everything must be consensus look we'll get to that but first we got to deal with the fucking psychopaths you can't just say like you know i'm going to fight hitler my way and basically we're all going to do you know peace and dandelions it's going to be consensus no you're going to get trampled by jackboots you've got to do Doruti and you need a leader and then he he fucking decides so then you say like okay faulty you are it you make the fucking decision it's that we we support you we do but at the end of the day it only works the reason why you have an arg and the reason why it's so cultish right is is because basically you need to work on the individual rebel to get the ego out because you must have a culture of egolessness so that if anybody comes with their identity politics and their ego and well i'm not going to go for some dictatorial thing i'm an anti-fascist and this sounds fascist and you say well get the fuck out because you're useless you've got too much of a fucking ego to basically listen to basically what the commander just told you so you'll never be a soldier so fuck we'll get the fuck out of here and so you must have that culture that basically people say like well we don't want to be soldiers and regimented in an army but you're stupid if you think that you can actually beat an army by not behaving like one so you have to behave like one to beat the army part of the leader's responsibility to make sure that you unwind all the institutions that were used to defeat the psychopaths so you don't you know Nietzsche you be careful if you go after monsters that you don't become one and that's the responsibility of the leadership and you know advisors and people like us and in particular the leader they must step down they must have the discipline to do that i'm sure faulty has the discipline to do that i'd be very surprised if he didn't so so yeah i don't think faulty has an ego so so you know that that's uh but but you get the general picture of, of what i'm saying is that you must have a commander it's absolutely up to him on the after lots of advice yeah, absolutely up to him to make those decisions and what demands to, and then we enable them. But when you know, you can you can argue the fact before the decision is made. But when the leader says that's the decision, you then you have to switch, and you can only switch without ego. You have to say, 
Well, I think it's fucking moronically stupid, but okay. Switch. How do we make this shit that even I don't believe in, but we're going to make it happen? You know, it's a, it's a challenge. Think of it like an engineer. It's like, okay, this is an impossible task, but we're going to make the impossible happen. And that's a winning army. But, but yeah, so I hope I make all that plain. I mean, that's what I think about it. Do you guys agree with all of this as a template? And, you know, then I'll, I'll, think, I'll think about how to explain it. But, but I mean, that's my thinking. I think so. Um, would you say that, like, uh, Lenin and the Russian Revolution is, like, a good example of what to do to win, but not what to do after you win? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, you see, what happens with those guys is this is the problem with ideologues. And this is in tankies in general, the Trotskyites and all these, these guys, no fucking stop. So if you look at Nesta Makhno and the anarchists in, in the Ukraine, is they overthrew the the Tsarist forces and the reactionaries. And then, you know, Nestor Magno stepped down. He went and got a wife and kids and <laughs> out of field. And, and this, the same happened with anarchists in Italy. If, if you look at uh, Garibaldi and those guys, it, the guys are exactly like faulty. Basically, he came from the farm. Garibaldi, all those guys were, the Carabinera and stuff, they, they were anarchists. They were farmers. And, and basically, he came from a farm. He led the Resorgimento, or whatever it's called, and he unified Italy and everything. And when the job was done, he said, like, that's it. Back to the farm and went back to plowing. And people said, but you can't go yet. I mean, you say, like, you say, like, no, the enemy's defeated. I'm not a settler. You know, basically, I'm a pioneer. So we've done the pioneering. Now go and do your fucking village mayoral stuff but i'm you know i'm a revolutionary I'm not, <laughs> I'm not here to cut ribbons and shit and so that's but yeah you need those guys to to be like that yeah the left all forgot this they didn't know at one time <laughs> they just fucking forgot it i uh, have a comment you... oh go ahead okay oh wait no no you you go you go Oh, thanks. Well, even in management school, I took uh, management classes a long time ago, and they talk about leadership and situational management and situational leadership. Consensus is all well and good um, if you have time, but if it's an emergency, and um, which is what we are in now, and the leader knows the answer and time is of the essence, uh, after you gather, you know, like from experience, you know what will work. And you, like you said, you listen to your generals or your assistants or your researchers, and then you make the decision because um, otherwise um, uh, everything will end <laughs> poorly because um, consensus takes such a long time. I mean, if you were brainstorming for a solution and you have a lot of time or trying to make a new product, that's all well and good. But um, if it's critical in time is of the essence, then the leader should take the, the decision. Yeah, so this is basic military training. If in, During basic training, they, they teach you all this about leadership. They generally have four quadrants. So then, you know, you have telling, selling, um, telling, selling, uh, persuading, and then laissez-faire. So, so, you know, it's exactly as you say. Wait, if they in officer training, they 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 put you in situations where they have a team of fifteen or something, and they say, "Okay, you the leader," and then they say they say the situation. They say basically the enemy's you know fifteen minutes away. You have to get over this river. Here's a few telephone poles and tractor tires. Uh, organize these people. And then they want to see, given the circumstances, what style of leadership you choose. So in the thing where the enemy is 15 minutes away, you have to take an authoritarian style. And you say, you do this, you do that, you do that. You don't have time to fuck around. And then, you know, then in another situation, they'll tell you, okay, something which has a lot more leeway, a lot more time. Then they want to see you adjust. And then you start saying, okay, guys. Here's the situation. Give me some ideas. And then you back and forth and you tease out some ideas. And somebody says, hey, i got a great idea. And you say, yeah, we'll take that great idea and this will be plan B. 
and then that's more consensus. Then the laser fair stuff is something where you, you know you've got too much on your plate, a uh, million things going on, and then you just say say to somebody like you know I need you to do this. You know, do you understand the situation? What the problem is? Okay, now go away and report back to me here, and this is what I'd expect to the outcome. And so, so you've got to adjust for for the situation. So you know, as a leader, you you'll be forced into one of those quadrants. Uh, but in general, you know, that's the way a hierarchy works and a military hierarchy. But you, I mean, as an anarchist, hierarchies are odious. But every anarchist knows that you have to adopt a hierarchy to beat a hierarchy. You won't beat a hierarchy <laughs> as you're a rabble. And the, the, the reason the re, you the reason is discipline. You do need discipline. Now, the Romans defeated so many um, tribal armies uh, just with psychology. And one of the famous ones I'll just give you because it's so obvious why, why a rabble can't beat a hierarchy. And that was basically the barbarian shield wall. So the barbarians had this tactic, which was invincible. The Romans couldn't do anything about it. And was to build a shield wall, you know, the say Gauls or something, they'd lock shields. And then you have all these phalanx of Romans coming at these shields and they didn't make a dent. The guys would just, you know, swat them over the top of their shield. And so they were, they were static line and it neutralized the Romans. The Romans always got through a shield wall and they, they got through with a faint attack. And what they did was they, they basically came up to the shield wall, fought and fought and fought and pretended that they were defeated turn around and fled. Then the, to do that, you had to be very disciplined because you're acting, you're acting a defeat. That's a very highly coordinated thing. Now the rebels behind the shield wall, they hadn't, didn't have the discipline. And so when they saw that the Romans were running, they would break the shield wall and say, whoa, we've won and they'll charge after the Romans. The Romans wouldn't get more than a hundred yards when they'd form up again and then just sweep through their lines because the seal wall was broken. By the time the rebels realized they'd make a horrible mistake, they would never fall up again because they were a rabble. And so the left is kind of like that. They're this kind of rabble with shield walls. And then it's, it's like collective intelligence. And the Roman army has a more collective intelligence because it's a hierarchy. Now, the, the ultimate hierarchy is a kind of a, a thing which you very rarely see, but you can do this in a cult and you can do it if you get all the members to get over their ego, uh, but it, it's a kind of a fluid hierarchy. So it means that you, all the members are entirely egoless and they can fulfill any position in the hierarchy. So, you know, you could get the street sweeper in or the, you know, the, the maid, the maid or the butler, and if, if the lord of the manor is out or busy or in, on, on the shitter, they can easily, you know, put on the manor of the lord and do his business, act like him and say, and they just impersonate him. And then, you know, when the business is over, they take it off, and go back to being the butler. So anybody could fulfill any role in the hierarchy. That is very, very powerful. So nobody is, is the leader. Is, is they also highly tuned and trained that they can all take over any position and they could be a leader for a minute. You'd never know who the leader was because it was like, I'm, I'm Spartacus. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm Spartacus. You know, so basically everybody could, uh, could fool anybody because you have the, the role, but you don't have anybody that actually has the ego in that role. So, so you, you know, the, what they teach you in the military is, is that you hold an office, but you you know that uh, the the rank is not the man. Right? So they say you know they teach soldiers that when you salute an officer, you're saluting the rank, not the man. So that's that's a very important thing because a lot of soldiers say, well, I think that guy's a stupid twat. I'm not saluting him. And you say no, a salute is you're saluting the position. You're not saluting the person that holds that position. And so it's so the position and the person that holds the position are entirely different. So, but in most hierarchies, like a U.S. corporation, people get appointed to to a post, and they say, "Well, now you're an executive," and we go, "Oh, I I am an executive." Well, that's a very, you know, uh, low level of in, of collective intelligence, because everybody is really an ego in a slot. 
And it's like, you can't get very far with that. But, but if they egoless fulfilling that spot, well, that's powerful shit. But anyway, so there you go. Leadership 101. <laughs> okay, so, so I think so, that's... Do you think we'll get away with, uh, away with this? With 40? I, I think 40 will go for it because I think, I think it's very frustrated with the, the idea that it's so hard to herd cats on the left. And you say like, well, it's not really in the, in the, in the cult format. Um, most of them are just playing along. They don't know. You don't ask them what the thing is, you know, what the final goal is. And then the, the grades and degrees. And so, you know, the inner circle knows more and about what's going on. But for, for the most part, the vast majority of people are just followers and, and they are. They are just followers. A vast majority of people, you shouldn't ask them for input to a decision because they, they are just followers. They don't have anything useful to add other than their ego. And you don't need their ego. It's superfluous. Can I add my, uh, my uh, bit as the, uh, <laughs> as the follower? Um, before you get to that stage with him, uh, you, you, you're going to have to deal with his uh track record so far and what he's accustomed to doing which is the conventional action and all the rest of it um and um uh, i just wanted to say a couple of things was uh that uh, rather than challenge the approach that xr has been taking for instead conventional activism is is don't challenge that with him is leave it alone because that needs to be there as a front. It needs to be kept up as a facade. It can be wound back a little bit so that it's not ruining so many people's lives by costing them money and giving them criminal records and all this kind of thing. Uh, you know, you can still do these sporadic, keep up the public perception that X are still going along their normal lines, being ridiculous, you know, or however you want to look at it. Um, but you, you, what you mean behind that you're then doing all the things that you're suggesting. You, you are building, you are, because that, doing the two things at the same time, using the, the facade and then doing the arg behind that, it leaves also room for the, uh, the, the people on the left who are never going to get over their leftness. So that leaves them a space to keep existing in their own delusion there. Um, but the ones that you can convince and the ones that you can draw into the cult and manage to get them to, to dump some of their ego in it, you've, you've got that, you can work with those. So there's a role for the ones that, that are sort of never going to be able to, to surrender their, their current perspective. And, and then you, you but fault is going to be working behind that. So he might possibly, for instance, have somebody else take over his conventional organizing and he'll just abandon that completely and, uh, or just give it a token, uh, uh, re you know, recognition and, and go over to, to the arc behind the scenes. Um, and I think a further advantage of looking at it that way is that you can't just go holus bolus into what you're suggesting. They've already spat him out once because he didn't suit them. And if he goes, if he just completely goes off again, it, it, or goes off in a new direction, they, they you, you, you know, you, they could, you could suffer too much damage if they spit him out a second time and say, no, we're just not going to, uh, you know, we don't want you to be part of this, blah, blah. And then, then he's left kind of exposed because if he's going to set up the ARG, he's got no cover. He's just acting as the, the person establishing the cult all by himself without any kind of smoke screen, any other silliness going on that will, will uh, um, uh, you know, be helpful. So I don't know, I, I just felt that that needs to be addressed first before it gets to the things that you just said a minute ago about the leadership. You, you've got to, and it also probably makes it easier to sell it to him because it gives him it's it's not saying to him you've got to dismantle every you, you, all of your work so far it, it doesn't stand for anything you've really got to shift camp. It's giving him the chance to to at least see a uh, uh, 
see that still standing. It just it, it just as a nominal thing, but it's it's still there, you know. Yeah, I, one of the reasons why I'd like some quality time one on one or or just two on one or at least just a few people um, is because there are a number of obvious subjects which are thorny. And you, you just raised one there. So one of the very first things that is a thorny subject is he's going to have to have a palace coup and get back his position within the movement. So, I mean, the, the movement has been hijacked. I mean, as far as I can see, it's been infiltrated and hijacked by the state. <laughs> That's what it looks like. But, but the very first step is, I mean, I think you know, the the name, the symbol, and him are the entire movement. So he's got to take that on board. And I think he will, but he's got to do a palace coup and, and take back the movement. Um, or, you know, the various th ways and strategies to do that. And one of the good things is that it's really America we're talking about. And Britain can go and become animal rebellion or just die on the vine. It's like, it doesn't really matter what happens in Britain. They can go and amuse themselves if, they, if they're not interested in the plan A. But um, it's all about America and America isn't well established. So I think the first thing for the plan is, is how to regain control of the movement. And because it, it was, it was unconscionable that he, he lost control of it. He should have fought, in my view. Uh, but again, it, it's all these nexus of confl uh, conflicting ideas on the left, like, oh, you have to have consensus. Therefore, you can't fight a disastrous move like ousting him, which ends the rebellion. And it's like, that, that's a catastrophic move. But you can't fight it. Why? Because then you're being an individualist, and then you know we're all collective, and then blah, blah, blah. so there's all these self-defeating sh shit, which you can only get over if you just take take them into a corner and say, look, you know this shit doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so and then once somebody says it, I'm sure if I say it, then it'll be fucking obvious. And then, it's, but it's 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 you know there, there's resistance to getting in a corner. And being told the truth because a lot of it is just denial of the truth so you know you've got to tiptoe through this one of the things that you you said i think is really important is that we have to concede on a no number of fronts and i think one of the things we have to concede is what gets done the goals of the movement we have to let go of and we just say, we'll, we'll give you the methods, you know, the ways and means to do this according to cult slash arg. Uh, we'll, but, you know, I think we have to concede that if it's some dumbass plan, <laughs> like everybody gets arrested and like, okay, fine. <laughs> it's like, damn stupid, but okay, this is how you would do it. Um, and then I think as time develops, we'll get more leeway to to get a better strategy. But I mean, judging from the email, it's still, you know, like, we have to decide what demands and uh, to who and it's like, it's like, I had what is like, oh, fuck, can't you get over this damn appeal to the government shit? It's like the government is useless. Yeah. See, it's that like, blows his cover straight away. If he's running the R, you don't, you don't make demands or talk to anybody. This is because you, you you just draw attention to the very part you don't want to draw attention to. You, you just I, do what you're doing. I think we have to self-pedal that, right? I think we have to self-pedal that because... Well, he's, he's going to make have to say is, okay, if, who, if he starts saying, well... He's, I mean, he's he's got got to we, we've got to be very careful on that because, you know, what I would say on, in that cases is like okay what demands do you want to make and to you and it's like well we want to demand that the government takes climate action and you know the more you get definition on that bullshit the more you see how stupid it is so you say okay fine what climate action well you know you start solar panels and wind farms and it's like like come on we all know that we passed those fucking solar panels and wind farms so what you're saying is you want to lobby the government to basically give subsidies to green tech well, it's fucking useless because basically there's 
the, it's going to do nothing for the CO2. So let's have a bigger goal and let's say reduce the CO2. But, but, but the government isn't he'll capable go, of that. He, he'll, just, he but he'll just go back to the existing XR demands. No, That's I what he's got he in mind. That. He knows that. Sorry. Peter, I, think, I think he knows that. And I think what you were saying, Gary, of keeping the smoke screen of a movement. Yeah. If he makes demands, it blows his cover. And that he goes along with the other guys who are still doing the same kind of thing. But in be, behind the scene, he's getting more um, um, followers in the US and working mm -hmm. with the ARG. Um, can enable him to put much more energy into 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 efficient uh, activism, and and it also it can enable him to to regain us to, to keep a certain place, uh, but still make compromise with this kind of collective thing where other people I do let the other people do the usual rebellion that they that they do. He he will not be so much part of it. Do you know what I mean? But there's still. He has to regain a place, but by by letting other people do the traditional rebellion and getting getting him to get in. I don't know if I explained myself well because I'm not so gifted with words as you are. But uh, do, do you follow my drift or? Uh, yeah. Um, so just want to say yeah, but from I, oh God, the US sorry. point of view, um, I see what you're saying because in the US we have groups like BLM, the Sunrise Movement, and it seems like we have to at least get that, if we want some form of unification, get that together. And then we'll see who, you know, we have that smoke screen of banner drops and all that, and then the real activism and then the ARG. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I always thought that the ARG superseded all that because all that stuff's a load of bunk. And, and what that stuff is designed to do is, is to, tackle is to make it, 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 will, will, it will just wither away here i'm only suggesting that yeah. it's a beginning a bit yeah. it, you know obviously you would just it does two things it 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 uh enables faulty to not make a complete lie of all the work he's done so far by keeping it going in a nominal kind of way for a little while uh and it also acts as a smoke screen but as you as time goes by you just don't allow that to wither away uh, but I just want to make an additional point regarding this, the point he's made about the demands, is that uh, you might be better approaching that with him from the point of view of what psychopathy is, is that it's no good making demands anyway, because you, you're demanding it from people who are, are not going to be able to, they're not redeemable. The, the, you, 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 can't, you can't change it from that. It's not going to be psychologically possible anyway. He's got to realise that his demands are trying to accomplish a, a psychological impossibility. Um, so do you think we could get away with arguing that really we, we should lower our sights and just accept that, you know, we're heading for a big catastrophe. So there's no demand that you can make from the government. The only thing you can do to lower the greenhouse gases is really to lower the GDP. I mean, what 2008 proved and the pandemic proved, but there's a one for one relationship with GDP and greenhouse gas. And so you have to reduce the GDP to reduce greenhouse gas and the government can't do that. So we have to write off the idea that we can actually influence greenhouse gas. And so then I think what's what's coming is that they will do geoengineering and th at the expense of a worse long-term outcome. But in the meantime, I give them credit for doing, you know, getting the average temperatures down by maybe one degree. So what it gives us is this world where it's very authoritarian it's basically a very dystopian world where resistance is almost impossible. I mean, I see daily these moves left and right. I just posted something from Democracy Now! where I can't freaking believe it. It's outrageous. They have as billionaires are paying the police and the National Guard out of their pocket to basically with to, to confront uh, activists and pipeline protesters with lethal force. It's fucking unbelievable. 
I mean, if 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 guys are still talking about wind farms and so, solar panels, this is a red lead emergency. This this is just going berserk. So the the door for activism is closing basically. So if we we got to lower our sights and say we just have to figure out a way to resist in the most dystopian totalitarian state environment. I mean, it's much worse than say the GDR or Nazi Germany and stuff. It's going to be surveillance and snitching and stuff at an extraordinary level because of the digital, you know, digital automation and stuff. People are so pacified. So, so we have to lower our sights, I think, and just say, we've got to find a way of resisting and not get too into demands for government and stuff. It, it's, uh, we've got to think more in terms of just uh, developing modes of resistance well, yeah. you've always maintained that that's ridiculous trying to, to appeal to government anyway. I mean, that, that's something you've maintained about XR from the, from the word go. Um, well, they're trapped. But, but again, the government's it, trapped. It, it, I mean, the government would love to do lots and lots, but they can, the, what they can do is very limited. And the, yeah, I've always said that but the same is, uh, with citizens' assemblies is what a citizens' assembly would be able to do less than a government. So it's like, well, yeah. all of the, the logical extension of a citizens' assembly is exactly what you've got a government. That's what it ends up as. You know, you, you, well, you less the government has enough. contacts, they, they have uh, social networks, they have a whole ecosystem that the CAs don't have. Now, they, the, you know, no, all but the they would, they would, I mean, in the long run, but it isn't. In it the isn't. long I mean, run, they they would what have. Would, a CA would make some, some demand, like some. Yeah you know, toddler kind of dictat. And there would be yeah. something, somebody would be affected like the cement industry. Now the cement industry is run by the fucking mafia. You know, you, they'll break knees to stop that shit happening. You, you know, just yeah. because some thousand twats in a citizen's assembly say, thou yeah. shalt not make any more concrete. Well, if the, you, you know, you think you're gonna get around the mafia that way? Fuck off, never gonna happen. So it's, it's ludicrous. It's just pie in the sky. What a government. No, what, what I meant, what I the, meant was the, the mafia. Uh, I mean, I realise there isn't a long term le left, but I mean, in the long term, I would just envisage citizens' assemblies being infiltrated and corrupted and just ending up being just like the government is now. But it, 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 initially, that wouldn't be the case. But it, that, you know, uh, anyway, we don't have to go down that pathway. But, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, but but it is important because I think we have to concede all of that, and we we have to go along with it, play along with citizens' assemblies and yeah, the yeah. demands of the government, and we just we just have to say, okay, well, you know, that's all part of keeping the, a policy. You set the agenda, and we'll explain how to do it. This is all part of of keeping up the, the image of XR pursuing business as usual without alteration and everybody saying, yeah, well, that's, that, that's XR, that's what they do. And they're just puttering along with their citizens' assemblies and they're occasional gluing themselves to things and smashing a few windows, and letting all the people who want to do that. And, but, but, and just, just let that tick away, you know? But meanwhile, there's something else going on behind the scenes and that's what Fault is devoting his time and energy to. Uh, and all the time he's wasting at the moment on conventional organisation can just some, there'll be somebody else that he knows who can take that over very willingly, and they they will want to do it, you know, and just well, just I, let I mean, that. It's it's nascent in America, right? There 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 isn't any infrastructure in America, and there, what there is is already split. They already have a divide between you know XR America and XR US, so it's basically it's. A complete waste of time you're starting from scratch as far as i can see so so i think that you forget all that old unworkable bullshit like banner drops and blockades the, the time for that is gone and so i think you you take it as an art you do it as an art so everybody gets inducted into the game as an art and they don't know they shouldn't know it's basically once you get initiated and you reach a certain degree then you in you you know initiated into the secret knowledge and part of the secret knowledge is we're all saving the world and then you know as you get higher and higher degrees you get more and more secret knowledge but you only reveal to somebody that it's for climate action when they're deeply embedded in the game I yeah think. but can't you i think there's a, a big opportunity in america when you look at it because we've you've already got the split you're going to get uh 
exa us i think is the one that's all you know heavily into the identity politics thing and, and uh let them go but i mean it, as long as we can get faulty's mind off the idea that any of that stuff matters a shit it's just let it wither on the vine or just do what it's basically just just fud it's just a diversion so just use it as a diversionary thing but i mean put zero effort and resources into that crap because oh I, yes I mean, i'm not suggesting put anything into it just let it let it run on yeah uh, but it, it did in the uk because basically it's it's just a rotary club for you know bourgeois eco anxiety yeah but you are offering him a, yeah, a yeah. new terrain with the us you see and for for somebody who's been on the back burner for quite a while and with the with the the idea of the og and all that i think it's going to be an extremely interesting prospect for him to let the reins go on the uk with his colleagues who are very happy to have him housed out anyway and to, to give him this new and i i, I was i'm a bit curious about the implementation of uh, of this in the us um you know uh, what well, sort it's, well it's all online i mean that's that's yeah. what i would like some one on one time to develop but but yeah it's um yeah i mean yeah i, I got to try and communicate the vision here because the the you know the the game uh forty talked about game designers and stuff like that and i think that's the kind of route we need to take is is think in terms of making something like bright axiom or and get those guys so i think we we should go we should get like jordy aitken and stuff and 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 really like to get jeff hull but at least anybody we can get as a game designer for bright axiom and carry on pretty much where those guys were maybe jason seagal and stuff and i i know somebody that knows jason seagal personally She's a little cagey about putting me in contact with it. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, but, but anyway, yeah, I think the vision is to, to try and work out uh, the game. And the game is for recruitment. So the very first thing is you don't think of aims like making demands and stuff. It's like make, we'll make demands later when we see what the terrain is. At first, we're basically building an army. And the... the yeah, the first is recruitment and the recruitment is into a game nobody should be able to tell what they're being recruited into until it becomes you know uh, until they're really hooked and it becomes a big part of their life then they get inducted into more and more stuff and the more and more stuff gets more and more exciting but it, um you know the, the the problem is it's very very niche to do the current thing, which is to say, well, we got to get interested people interested in climate change and raise awareness and recruit people for this. It's like, no, people that are not inspired by that story. The, the story has to be grandiose. And you have to say, you know, we are, it's romantic. We're, we're a secret cult, completely underground. We're saving the world. And, you know, you, we're going to let you in on the plan and, you know, go like that. But it's far more, you know, first uh, getting the game going and uh, organizing people around this romantic narrative, which the, they will develop too. And then you na gradually, you know, nudge the narrative drop by drop into the current circumstances. And then you, but you drop in things like the storm or something, and then you define later a storm could be. 3,000 arrests, or it could be, you know, strikes like debt strike, rent strike, you know, wildcat labor strikes and stuff. But, you, you know, I think we concede that that kind of goal is left up to faulty. And then um, we just show how you will get there with an arg. But you, you've got to take a long time recruiting and prepping and not all this running around the street it must be done undercover as soon as you run in the street the the state starts moving against you so you know it's got to be something that the state doesn't uh, consider a threat and then any new thing so you start developing all of this stuff online i mean the the whole thing is like 
just just follow what QAnon did. And so you start on 4chan getting a like-minded kind of ethos. You get the egregore going. And you might be kind of shocked with what the egregore turns out to be. But you've got to, you know, it's, yeah. We've got a long haul, I, I can see. <laughs> but we, what Fawlty needs, needs to do is to realize that he's, he's not steering people. He's not herding cats. He's, he's a mirror reflecting people back to, to themselves. And he must, not, he must realize, you know, that all these people, they, they are serving the interests of, of the collective, of the crowd. So basically it's, it's a mirror man sort of reflecting this. So you have a bit of leeway to distort the image that you return, but it's pure narcissism for the crowd. The crowd wants to see itself and then develop its, its narrative with the leader. So you concentrate on that. You don't concentrate on demands for the fucking government. I mean, the government's not in this. It's a pure romance between the leader and the crowd. So the, the leader needs to explore on the, you know, on the podium in all these formats, do an Andy Kaufman, and basically discover, you know, this, this huge uh, potential where it's, it's basically you're exposing all the latent desires and all the hidden things and bringing them out in, from, from the... From, from the players in the game or the audience. And so, you know, that once that's all established, then you can start moving into this kind of organizing mode. But the, the fucking, you can't, you, to start from a blank slate and organize, it's just, what the fuck are you talking about? This is, what book did this come out of? It's retarded. I like the idea of uh, your um, allusion or mentioning of romance, um, like the, the mysterious goal to save the world is romantic and then uh, the romance between the leader and the crowd um, from the interview that we had with faulty I felt he was uh, um, because he said you know because of his background historically the form of um, activism um, he seemed to be pragmatic but at the same time like he's not wedded to what tools would uh, would would be used to achieve goals but at the same time it seems like he would be measuring success based on his theoretical background of how activism was supposed to work in the days of the 60s or 70s or 80s so i think it will be a big challenge um to kind of counter his impatience because uh, like you're saying it's like prepping prepping the soil and you can't have a harvest if you're you know the seeds are not planted yet so i think it'll be a big challenge but um maybe on the boat <laughs> you'll be able to um to communicate yeah there's so much in what what you said there. but i think that you you're absolutely right um part of the thing is to get rid of some of the baggage so the, the i think that underneath it uh it's kind of like it was you know in terms of faulty's character he was actually made for the role. He's kind of been distorted by all the external influences and stuff he's read and stuff. It's kind of wrecked the raw material. So he seems like good raw material that's gone to waste with all the bullshit. So I think it's a question of him rediscovering what he knows is right. He has it in him to be a charismatic leader and be a cult leader, but he needs to be encouraged to, to find that role. And, and so he needs to be coaxed towards it because you know, the left doesn't allow him to do that. He's not allowed to be himself. And it's like saying, no, no, you have to be, you know, an outsized version of yourself. You need to start discovering that. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, in terms of goals and where uh, reasonable goals, I mean, is, is first of all, it's like dangerous to think in terms of goals, but the, the goals at first are very abstract. It's like, you know, what's, what's your goal for a romantic, outing or something like that you know like wow i want to get the girl in bed pronto <laughs> it's like oh okay whoa faulty <laughs> it's like let's let's just say like uh the goal should be like establishing stuff establishing rapport establishing mutuality you know basically well, you think more in terms of of these more abstract things you'll get to concrete goals like you know okay 
now I get my hand in a nickel. It's like, whoa! <laughs> Hold on! <laughs> so, Very so, concrete goals. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like a little too concrete, little too concrete. Let's let's just <laughs> let's just find out, you know, each other's backgrounds, whether we like the same music. You know, it's like yeah, that's what you're doing at first. Hey, well, you know, we'll get there, faulty. Don't worry. Just don't don't rush the maiden. You know, but he's you know, it's got this idea that you can start coal, and and just whip people up to take over the government. It's like, no, you have to wait for opportunity and so you have to spend endless time cultivating and prepping and getting ready for for this thing and when you're when the government fucks up that's when you strike and do all of these things which he thinks you just do on the cold but the the government is is moments away from doing something spectacularly stupid i mean we've got to move fast just because you know there's a great a financial great reset coming now, there's, going to, there's going to be a big opportunity with a lot of pissed off people and if you have the formula for how to express that pissed off thing you win you know that's what happened with the arab spring is all the extremists and radicals they all hijacked the arab spring because they all had a plan they all knew they all had their egregore together they all knew what it was like to be in a you know a, a islamic fundamentalist they all knew that we we here to establish Sharia law, and then so, so they all worked in unison. All the other guys say, "Yay, we've got the government. Now what? Uh, I don't know. What should we do next?" And it's like, yeah, of course, the extremists just ra ran over them because they they were prepared. And so it's much more. You have to establish the egregore, and then you know, the the concrete plan uh, will present itself when the, when the government fucks up. But the government's going to go to war soon or so, do something immensely stupid or they're going to be bread riots or something like that but then then you can immediately take advantage of that with the with the public outrage but um, you know you you have to start prepping people with the idea that there's that day is called the storm and this is what we'll do and you you'd have you know these people prep to be militant these people to organize you know, so they they basically you, you would say right put the plan into action flick the switch and then everybody runs but it takes a long time to get there you know you know in, in the meantime it looks like you're doing bugger all but you're brewing this you know you've got to brew and ferment a revolution you can't get there by you know okay what's the path to action after this meeting it's like go away and think <laughs> it's basically establishing an egregore it does not say like what's the goal to establish, uh, you know, hive mind today. Well, let's make sure that we have twenty people integrated in the hive mind by Wednesday. It's like, what? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it's bullshit. So you have to develop the story, you know, back and forth. It's you know an exchange and a dialogue between all the members and the people in the game, and yeah, and then develop it. So that's exactly uh, what the goal was saying when he started to. Um, to develop the resistance when he was in England and I was reading his memories uh, not long ago again I reread them because it, it's it's this slow powerful kind of prepping and also very interestingly from the same example a leader who totally disappeared afterwards when he was not needed anymore Do you know who let his complete just okay fine and then came back and then disappeared again um, there's a lot to learn in that French um, personality. Uh, it's it's controversial, but there's a lot of things in what you're saying that are just uh, resonating from what I learned when I was younger, observing. Well, well, I mean, I think we're staking everything on the fact that that Faulty has the legs to be one of those people. I mean, I think he does. So, he, I mean, he he does he does. He doesn't have it all. He's not self-contained with all the ingredients to be that personality. But in a way, I think that's that's good because we can augment it with you know people that design the game and people that advise him, and you know we can make it a collective uh, activity. So, he, but you know he can play the role, and the role is um, the cult leader. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, uh, he has to get to Greece. So what is? Yeah, I, I think that more and more and more. I guess we just we we maybe we just yeah. I guess we're gonna, just going to have to take it as it comes and the, just the next, uh, yeah. But the next interview, the next interview with him, because he, he said in his email that he was um, he was looking forward to meet with us again. So um, yeah, well, what's when, we when should we meet? When, when when are you guys around for the next one? Well, for me, I mean, I, personally, I'm I'm open to any any time, uh, any day, um, if it's for that cause. But it's for him to. I think the agenda for the next meeting should be um, geared towards um, getting him to move his arse away from where he is and just maybe get a couple of people with him to to travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While the UK, because the, the cases in the UK are going up like mad now, I don't know what yeah. other traveling and all but that it's looking a bit you know the, the numbers great. are going up in greece and they, they the prime minister just came out today and said like they're not going to do another lockdown they said they said basically the economy is more important and people have suffered enough so they said like fuck the numbers we're just going for the economy <laughs> and I, I i think i think that that most greeks feel that because because they rely on tourism, so they're much more fucked than the average country. So, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's the same in Ireland. They're they're just ready to sacrifice anything to to get the hospitality, tourism, and thing and working. And uh, but if you look at the figures in Europe, it's um, it's looking like the next few months are going to be totally. You, you just don't know what's going to happen. So I think if he can travel now soon is the best time because you can't yeah, make that's, i think that's, it's that's what i think it yeah it's, it's going to be soon. Possible. while you've got this kind of summer thing where they're opening mm -hmm. uh you know mm -hmm. even if he had to fly i know he wouldn't fly but you know mm -hmm. i don't know but the, the boats are still going fine this the, the the tests are it's easy to get to the it's easy to get to the mainland yet from england to europe and because it, we don't know it by September October it, it could look very grim I don't know I don't I don't know but um, well no. yeah I, th I mean the numbers are going up in in Israel which is implies I think they got 53 percent vaccination so the, the, it implies that the vaccinations are not working which is kind of what I thought <laughs> for the for the Delta variant I don't think they're working so it's like yeah predictable. But what it means is everybody will have a, a bit of a laugh for the summer, pay for it in the winter. So I think we've got to we've got to move quite fast. Well, maybe um, use that because I mean the general tendency is just people are fed up. You want to go out. I mean, who escapes that? Even the likes of Faulty, you know, and and his friend or whatever who go with him. I think it's it is a it is an opportunity now to to try to focus on on. Uh, uh, on, on trying to uh, to seduce as much possible yeah. to to take a break and and with the aim of furthering our agenda then you know mm. well you might just have to say to him look this just this could be the uh, window of opportunity we just can't afford to miss because if, it, if you know mm. if, if he doesn't take advantage of it now <clears throat> The chance might not might not come again. Well, that's um, why the next email should be should be yeah. offering and also maybe the meeting yeah. soon and <coughs> making arrangements, concrete arrangements, very in a short while, maybe with a private call with you or with Gary mm. or whoever to, to 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 arrange that. But two things in parallel: meeting to talk. But I think practically we need to focus on getting him out of the UK. Yeah, I think so too. I I realized from that response, it's it's very good response, but I can see there's a long long way to go. So we just got to chisel away at it, I think. And yeah. But yeah, I think at this stage we just try and concede a lot of the stuff which we think is bullshit, <laughs> but it just it just go for the positive, right? And just you know as i yeah i think 
as uh, it's a, it's a difficult concept to understand, but um, I think if we can, if we have another call, so let's let's set up. I'll, I'll set up. I'll say, I'll I'll say you know whatever day suits you, but this sort of time is good, right? Everybody's good with this, or, or maybe five o'clock. Uh, is, is that earlier? What, what time are we at the moment? 5.30. 530. 5.30. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah, that's gonna... fine for me. Okay, if everybody's yeah, okay, just... then I'll say 5. If, uh, you okay. can see and say any day. Because I'd make any day. So it's important. But, okay, so then, then when we do that, then I think... Uh, yeah, we'd let Faulty lead and ask questions and stuff and try and explain the concept a little bit further and see how far we can go with pushing, you know, about, to, you know, just basically a, a retreat and just, uh, just uh, having a crash course in how to do this, you know. I think the idea of retreat is a very well-chosen term because i think that if we can channel him into this type of of psychological uh, appeal to him to to be in a place as you said close to nature you can you can apply all the all the all your wits and and and, mm. uh, and talents to to groom my persuasive <laughs> abilities it's generally my persuasive you know, abilities and I think that we need to talk about the window opportunity at the moment with COVID, that it might not be possible mm. soon and that to, to try to get him, I mean, I don't want to sound impatient, but, uh, and we don't want to get that across to him too much that we are impatient, but I think he needs to realize that it's um, it's crucial that he might make it. I don't know how his life is, if he's busy or whatever, but mm. I think it's uh, at the moment, it's so e it's easy in a way oh. to travel because because the, the whole atmosphere is people are just, oh, it's the summer. And so you might appeal somewhere to him to just, you know, just go. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, one of the things, can, can we offer in this, that we will get together all these people because um, now he's asked about game organizers. And so maybe we could try to get Jordy Aiken and stuff and start, you know, talking to him. Um, Lionel Snell, I, he, I was very pleased uh, with him. He watched the, my videos and stuff, but then I'm a little worried now because he, he said he's got sick and he, he hopes, he said he's, he's sneezing and coughing too much to, to chat, but as soon as he's better, then we, we will chat. And he said, I hope I haven't got COVID, but I was like, oh no, God, please no, don't, don't get COVID now. Uh, but yeah, anyway. But, uh, I, a fever is terrible this year with the rise in CO2. I'm suffering yeah. from it. it uh, so there's a lot of sneezing and coughing around, like it's just up until July, it's going to be like that. It's just everywhere. Well, yeah, well, I hope it gets better soon. But anyway, I thought, you know, him, um, and I think we should start putting out feelers to the, some, maybe some more of the guys that were involved in Bright Axiom and stuff. There, there was a, a girl yeah. who, who set up a lot of the game, an artist and stuff. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll look that up. Uh, are you talking about in Bright Axiom? There yeah. Was, um, designer there oh, yeah she, yeah uh, i was looking at um a few producers from the jejun institute yeah i'll also check out because yeah. i did reach out to jordy again but he hasn't responded so oh, i don't awesome. know if he's if he changed his mind but i'll try again <laughs> but spencer oh. spencer was telling us the last Spencer's, time he would be happy to engage yeah. again with us so we could eventually, if if other people are not um, available for some reason, we could reach out to him again, and it might be interesting yeah. because he, even though he's not directly involved in the creation of the game, he's got a great uh, attitude and and, yeah. and experience in that. Oh yeah, no, I, I took him as as kind of red, um, but um, yeah. Um, 
that that would be quite a good crew right there quite a good team of those but man i would love to get jeff hall <laughs> yeah i guess we've got to tiptoe slowly towards getting him i don't think it'd be easy to get him but but can i go back again here as usual wind you back a little bit it's the problem of getting up in the middle of the night for these talks uh, is I don't think he's the kind of person who uh, is going to be sold on a nice retreat and something for him. I think he's too bound up in his dutifulness and his yeah. responsibilities and his work. Uh, I, personally, I wouldn't waste time trying to sell him uh, this uh, in terms of something nice for him personally, mm. you know, as a holiday, as a break. I just don't think that's that's going to cut any mustard with him at all you, you're going to have to just stick with the other points um because i could tell like you know if you think back to the emails that we were sending him just trying to get him to respond to the the auction that there was and it was it was just basically oh I'm, you know i'm involved I, i'm I, the the subtext was i'm an important organizer here and i can't be distracted from my my uh, vital work you know uh, and I, I don't have five minutes to breathe and, and even in that time when we spoke to him in the uh uh like when the, the first uh, interview we had with him um you could see there he said oh, i'm off i'm lecturing all next week or every day next week or something mm -hmm. like that one place to the other trouble he's just going to uh that, that's that's his life i don't think he's got now got an interest or or a space for mm -hmm uh yeah this you know niceties like that so anyway yeah I'm, I'm sure yeah i think you're right but yeah it's well yeah i mean it's i mean i think of it as a working thing it's just it's uh you could, i just don't feel that you can go very far just um you know with these online conferences they they they're good but uh you need a, a bit of stew time, a bit of think time, and stuff like that. It's um, yeah. Well, let's see how we do. Let's see if we can tiptoe towards it. Yeah, but how? What? What? So, any suggestions about how to get him to to accept this invitation? So, is, is there any other other? I, I have a, I, I maybe a private call just not conference but just a face-to-face -face. either gary or hume probably would be the best um i don't I know i can't think of any way i think at this stage what we probably have to do is to uh just let him take the lead and you know at some time if it makes sense say look this is the only way it's going to work is if we just give block of time just give lots of thought to work all of all of this stuff out but yeah i think that's that's what we'll have to do but yeah you see if if he leads and we just listen uh at some stage he'll i think he'll get to a big topic that would take longer than an hour to get into and say like you know so I, yeah, I think, that, yeah, I'm starting to think that's the way to get there is is to get to get to a point where he realizes that it, it's just not working on, on these kind of calls. So if we, you know, if we have a, an hour call and then maybe another one and you're like, yeah, it's just it's going to take a lot longer than just these calls, you know, intermittently to, to work it out. So we're going to do a uh, an invitation to him for another call very mm -hmm. short maybe next sunday or before that yeah I'll, I'll send a reply saying any any day this time yeah. Yeah. and then yep we take it I, at it. But I guess he yeah i guess he has to lead from from now yeah. oh well yeah it's yeah it's um, like Oh, I was yeah. going to say, yeah, ultimately, you know, it has to be his choice. And to him, it has to feel like his choice. We can't be seen trying to, like, prod him, you know, of course, him towards yeah. it. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think we just have to be a passive about it, really. Yeah, I think we just have to keep on giving more and more bait. So just, yeah, I guess we have to just open the kimono more and more. So I guess we, I think we've done pretty well so far. <laughs> so far. Yeah, think, yeah, we I just gotta put the sweetener on. Gotta keep yeah, putting the sweetener on, and maybe he'll take better. a bite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to leave it up to the fates now. Yeah. At some stage, here might not it be better just to make a plain statement, just say, you know, look, we really don't think this is going to get off the ground unless you're willing to, to, to have the sort of intensive time. Um, yeah. The, the thing yeah. is, it, it's it, to get there in a positive way is going to be fucking difficult. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have to get it so so that it's kind of inserted as an oblique shot somewhere. But yeah, oh, wait, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, I think this has been good to talk about because I think it's certainly talked me into the right frame of mind and i think the right frame of mind is is you know just soft pedal it and and let you know let him take it a bit from here and just see see where he wants to take it i think is more <laughs> is the best thing it's yeah. like fishing yeah 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 I, w I wish there was um i wish there was an easier way but yeah, it's, uh, I feel there's a lot at stake, you know, because uh, it's like, I've waited two years for this. <laughs> and I think, like, I think like, what the hell will I do if, uh, if this all goes down? I feel like it's like two years of work wasted. I, 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 had, a, I had a question about um, if, if you or somebody in the group mentioned Falk's name to Jeff Hall, will it draw him out, you think? Oh, he's not interested. Yes, really. Yes, but but you see, it's it, it's difficult because what I would like to say to Faulty is like, you know, just you know, ring Jeff Hall; he'll definitely take your call. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I I think that's kind of what our job is supposed to be. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to do that. Uh, I don't know. Do you think we could see that? Yeah, that I mean, maybe after Faulty agrees to get on the boat, <laughs> then you can say, Yeah, no, well, I would. I mean, got Faulty on yeah. The boat. yeah, no, I would. I would definitely, I would leverage that to say, Look, you know, this is a golden opportunity. I think we must, we must milk it for all it's worth to get any anybody that you know, that's uh, there's so many people. That, that you can get that would be be on board with the, the plan and offer help and stuff. But I, I mean, just it, it's the right time. Is there, there's so many people that that are thinking there's something's got to be done. You can feel that you know there's a, a storm break waiting, and I think everybody can feel this coming on, the steamroller coming on, and nobody really knows what to do with it. So I think you could have a dam burst if you said like, "Hey guys." Shit's rolling. <laughs> People be like, "I want in." <laughs> so yeah, maybe we should sell that. Yeah, I. There we go. Maybe well, that's the key. Well, is 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 to say, yeah, we we need to basically, you know, it would light the spark to just say that that's it. Isn't that it? Is is we we need to say, we need to light the spark that then everybody wants to get on board. Something I everybody's kind of stymied. They don't know what to do. You say we've got to do something to light the spark, and you say that's it. We have the retreat. You get everybody involved in it. Gets we'll we'll line people up and we'll use it to to light the spark so that this new game in town, and the, you know. I think there'd be so many people that would, would want in on a new plan because everybody's out of ideas, aren't they? And we're sitting there with ideas. like a sparkling egregore. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, am I wrong? I, I think there's so many people that would get on board this that, I mean, guys that are really on the fringe that, that are doing you know, Allison type things and stuff and they're saying like, yeah, we got it get real <laughs> this this train is leaving the station so so maybe instead of in the future instead of focusing on a meeting where we interview one person we get together people who I, are I was kind of about, thinking and we no, just, I was thinking just that. You know, connect these nodes and see what happens no but, but that's what my thinking was all along that's what I was trying to do with Kevin and all of those guys it's just that they <laughs> very very hard work <laughs> as we just as we just seen in the last interview it's like these these guys are not coming out of their shell right you see you see I, I was kind of blindsided in this last interview because that's what I was thinking is we 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 talk to these guys we interview them establish a bit of rapport and then you know weave it all together into a big party but it's it's kind of Shocking in a way, it's like, come on, I thought, yeah, aren't you on this team? You write this stuff, you say all this stuff, but you're completely out to lunch. <laughs> you, you know, you, you just like writing about it. You don't want to do anything? Okay, I get it. But the so same you do, happened to me. You do a big thing, let's say on a symbolic day, or I don't know, Bastille Day or something, where there's Kevin, Dimitri, uh, Faulty, uh, yeah, well, no, I kind mean, of see it that way. Let it happen. I see that way. That's, that, so, so all of my companies I've started, I've, I've basically bootstrapped them from the ground up with virtually no funding on just about vapor, vapor. And, and that's the way to do it is you basically bring people slowly in to this thing where suddenly everybody thinks, wow this is really happening and suddenly everybody's mind explodes and they go, fuck, this is probably the best team that's ever been assembled to do this. So, yeah, <laughs> but I, it takes a long time to get, you know, people out of their egos and to say like, yeah, okay, what I always want to say is, okay, very nice, very nice. Okay, enough about you. Shove your fucking ego. Are you interested in this? <laughs> you just can't say that. You have to go. Well, I'm very interested in your ego, and that's all very nice. And tell me more about your mother. And you're like, anyway, back to climate change. <laughs> and it's like, oh God, this is such agony. Can't you just? You know, it would be so much easier to be famous to say, you know, to be like Elon Musk and say, guys, we're going to tackle climate change. This is it. Having a big rock concert. Everybody's going to be there, and we're going to get shit done. And everybody's like, oh, I want to be there. <laughs> everybody's like turning people away at the door. But, you know, it's, uh, if you're starting from, from this, you got to convince people. This, see, see the vision? Oh, yeah, he sees a little bit of the vision. Uh, see this one? It's like, have a little sniff of this. You know, come, come, come. <laughs> you gather all these people around. Eventually, you say like, yeah, <laughs> you see? <laughs> and they go, ooh. And they all think they they saw it all before, but yeah, to me, I, I can definitely see uh, you know something snowball out of that. So I yeah, think maybe that. Yeah, you like should, lead them in the circle, and then simultaneously, everyone connects the dots, and then boom. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, this might be the pitch to faulty. Yeah, yeah, that is sounding good. Mm -hmm. It's sounding, sounding good. very good. I've applied that in my life in many occasions where I've brought together totally different people from, you wouldn't know what different horizons and the results were absolutely fantastic. And it's just, it's just the alchemist kind of boo, you know, you yeah. just, just let it happen. Yeah, and it's 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 a lovely moment when everybody suddenly realizes with this kind of awestruck dumbness that you're saying like my god this is fabulous it's all these people came together and then they all just perfect for the the role and everybody's like yeah and then everybody thinks there's nothing we can't do and then that's that's where you want to want to get to we'll get there we'll get there but uh so yeah okay so but anyway we must get more of these people 
um, you know, that, that, that can do stuff or not. I want is, uh, th given that we've spoken to Spencer McCall, does he, would he know, <clears throat> uh, uh, how to contact Jeff Hull or whether it's even possible? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was tiptoeing towards that. I was hoping we'd get another, another interview with him and we could start talking about this, you know, okay. and then do you want to have an interview with him soon or wait? Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. But you know, we got, we got so many cool people like from, you know, GDR and all of the, it all fits together. So, so nicely. And when, once you've got some kernel going, you can, you know, move outwards and get so uh, much more famous people. But if they, you know, not, it doesn't seem to work with people with an ego. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, but if you get people who've got a big ego like Dimitri or maybe Kevin, I don't think so much. It's just somewhere else. But and 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 if we manage to get the mother of all meetings with a mixture of all these kind of things, so some, some things could happen that would strip people from a lot of their because they of their of their um, ego because they would be mm. in a total unknown territory with with a thing that would be you know and being that this online thing seems to be working and that much more is happening than we can actually realize. I really mm -hmm. think that in the future we could we could think about this kind of of melting pot of all sorts of mm. you know people we have in the past met and talked to and get them together and just whatever no agenda and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, but the the idea of of getting together and you know doing this this kind of arg or uh, you know. A movement is is really kind of nice. The um, yeah. Uh, what was I going to say about that? Um, something you said there. Um, oh, I lost it. Spencer anyway. and and uh, Spencer McCall was going to be able to was telling us the last meeting that he was. It was difficult to get Jeff Hull to to get interviews and you were going to try, you, you were talking about trying to get through to him again about on this issue because he was saying it's, it's quite difficult to. Yeah. Yeah. But here I was, I, I always thought that your plan was to do this kind of thing, but that that will be done when Faulty is with you on the boat, not before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it's a draw well, card. That makes not, sense because if you do it before he comes, he, he, yeah. he, he might use that as a reason not to come and say, oh, we'll, we'll just do it all this way. Oh, no, no, sorry. I wasn't clear there. I meant we talk yeah. to these people. I didn't mean with folks. Oh, no, not, not, I see. Just us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think are we just wasting time? Are you better off just, just getting them, getting those people together when, when he's with you and yeah. taking it from there? Because yeah, we're, not, be. we're not, we're uh, not, you know, remarkably amazing people as we are we're, we're not he's the one who's got to be yeah <laughs> who's doing it yeah. you know um yeah every, every, i think everything would crystallize around him pretty pretty rapidly in fact but should we get a hold of that the guys uh who have that mega mark thing in area 15. That sounds like a good idea. It's just um, there, there was one seeing... one guy that started it. There was one. Yeah. Uh, I can dig into it. Yeah. I you see, I made the claim that that in America there are lots of things like that that, that people that might be sympathetic and and would you know they've got their own thing which they would definitely be sympathetic to climate activism and stuff like that leading because they're, they're virtually art projects and art artists and that are, they're really activists so i've always thought you could could rely on those kind of people <clears throat> to pitch in and they, they're kind of ideal so it might be worth sounding them out 
Yeah, sure. I'll uh, dig into it. To see, yeah, I I watched that um, YouTube video and it was pretty amazing stuff that they have. Yeah, but, but you see, what what I had in mind was that they 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 doing an odd road, right? but theirs is closed ended, so. I get the feeling that they would love, you know, they, they're doing more and more of those stores and stuff. But I think that uh, they might love the idea that you say you take that store, you give, you know, a rabbit hole in each one of those stores that expands into this bigger arg. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure they go like, yeah, that's good. Because, I mean, how many times can you go to that store before it's like, oh, well, <laughs> novelty's worn off now. You've got to go on to something else. And so it, it would give them the next step in their, in their story. I don't think there are a lot of people like that in, in the States because, you know, Mike, there's so many of those kind of things, weird shit, you know? Yeah. Well, there no are in the Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so... Yeah. You know, they uh, <laughs> people that have you know magical mystery tours and this. The, I mean, in in Seattle and so just so many of those kind of things, and and then you know you, the idea of having a little coffee shop which is a really a complete front and it's a complete rabbit hole. I, I always like the idea of having like a a magical space, so you don't set up a shop. You set up a magic so in other words it changes all the time so you start off as having a little kind of harry potter coffee shop and it's like the the duma coffee shop or something and you go in there and it's exactly like a mega mart and, and you, you and then you, you only do that for a week or two and then you change it and so it's suddenly you know kind of an antique shop or something or or you know harry potter bookshop and then you know, you walk in there and say, I thought this was a coffee shop. And say, no, it's, it's always been a bookshop. Can I help you with it? And then you give them a book that say, I think you might be looking for this book. And yeah, and then they go and, you know, they go, they get the idea that magic shit happens on this, in the square. It's not just the oldie coffee shop or something open-ended. I mean, something open-ended, not closed-ended. So There's something that young people are doing in Ireland in, in things called escape rooms. And it's, yeah. it's funny little places that are scattered in some cities and you go into there and woo, it's just like a, an, another yeah. a universe that changes all the time. And it's a, it's, it's a total uh, underground and parallel kind of, of, of people there. They're really in another universe there. They're, you, you, do you yeah, have yeah. the escape rooms? And, and yeah, the yeah they're all over America. This yeah, escape, escape from the room. Yeah, yeah. So, and and they a lot of those people that do those escape rooms they they done previous art projects and things like that and they they they've done things pretty much like arts so it's it's pretty pretty native to them yeah yeah I mean that that's what I have in mind is to tap into all of that and and say you know like taking art and that subversive thing and unifying it and I think, you know, faulty is a figure which you could unify all that kind of thing around. Well, I'm glad we had this talk because it's kind of surfaced that really what it, <laughs> what I think is will work, right? Yeah. Well, that's cool. Any other okay. things, or should we end it? Well, it's two hours, probably. Even. So I guess. A good thing to do would be to look for individuals to talk to. And yeah, maybe we should go. Uh, all of us should go out and have a look to see if we can find things like a Megmart and stuff, and then find and find people that have done weird stuff, even the paranormal stuff. Yeah. And yeah, uh, you you can get wacky very quickly down the paranormal thing, but. Okay. You can they take a little foray down there and see. I had an interesting <laughs> situation happen um, a few days ago. I I was looking up Ramdas, you know the 
Yeah. You, you know that guy. And then yeah, yeah. somehow something in my mind went back to, and we spoke about this guy, Ram, Ram LZ. <laughs> and I said, wait, is Ram? What's this Ram thing? No, we talked so, about uh, Ram Dass, oh, no. uh, palming the oh, LSD and stuff like oh, that. Oh, no, right. Right. Yeah, oh, no, Ram Dass was, uh, he, he palmed the, the LSD oh, right. when um, Timothy Leary went to go and oh, see him. Okay. And Timothy Leary was so impressed because he gave him like 15 um, LSD pills or uppers or something. No, LSD. Yeah. And so, and uh, Ram Dass palmed them because those those guys are fakers they're pretty good uh yeah. magicians and so they he didn't know that right. he thought they're all straight up legit spiritual right. guys and so but he he palmed those 15 and he pretended to take them and then he went like oh, <clears throat> you know no big deal because you know timothy leary and those guys were like uh, no rum dust not timothy leary. rum dust was no hang on rum dust went to see this guru guy i can't the guru guy's name but yeah ram das right. gave him these 15 pills and he just palmed them and then pretended to take them and then ram das was like whoa this is going to be amazing to see what this guy does and he did nothing he just acted completely normal and so then ram das went around the whole world writing books saying all this oh, right. you know and then yeah. but he was exposed by one of his his right hand men or something and he said nah what the guy did was he palmed them and then some other fools came up, you know, they came up the mountain pass and then that uh, he gave them Dasan, you know, a, uh, an audience. And then uh, they they give Prasanna, which <laughs> Prasanna is like a little so, something magical. So you have like, it can be like a bit of dust or a bit of hair or anything. But anyway, often something from the fire, you know, from the puja. And so then he took a little bit of ash and uh and so and gave them uh, as persona to you know i said like put a little bit of this on your tongue and he, but he crushed he crushed the lsd pills in the ash and so these guys they were you know these westerners they go down the hill again and they're all like tripping on the bus and then they went and said you know you've got to see this guru guy you know man he's the real deal when we came back from there we were seeing stuff. Yeah. and that's how these guys operate like right. Yeah, yeah. Ram Dass didn't know that. <laughs> He's a bit naive. Yeah. I was just trying to say that. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll think these people will come up, like, um, and we'll, we'll. I'm sure we'll reach. We'll be able to reach out to them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you. What you really need is kind of rogues. So they kind of, they trickster figures, not. See, some, some of these guys take themselves too seriously. And so the paranormal guys, they often a bit, <laughs> take themselves a bit too seriously. But you need you need people that are absolute, you know, the charlatans and uh, charlatans and harlequins and uh, tricksters. Uh, and well, guys are... them in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. I just have to to go and dig a bit, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> Ireland's a treasure trove, oh isn't, my God. It, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a treasure trove, but yeah, but uh, this, um, there's no limit to, I mean, you can even go wacky, like, you know, eventually guys like David Icke and stuff will not be on the pale. <laughs> the, the thing is that you can, you can put anybody in the mix because you know, they don't have to be a permanent fixture. You could just visit and then everybody goes, what the? And then you're like, oh, tricked you. <laughs> but yeah, it's a Gurdjieff. Uh, Gurdjieff was, was a good good model for this. Gurdjieff, uh, they, they called him the something rascal. But yeah, he he was uh, just a trickster figure and he... he he tricked everybody, but he always with the aim of raising their consciousness and getting past ego. And that's... My, my father had Gurdjieff's books on his bedside, and I was always amazed to, to look. When I was a child, I, or a young, young girl, I didn't understand anything. I was just digging into this, but I, and he was exactly that sort of character. So I, I, I can understand exactly what you mean by, by Gurdjieff's uh, persona. I've never really got near to read completely all his things because uh -huh. I started but 
I suppose because of a family thing, I was kind of, oh my God, my dad like that. And I was like, of course, um, he's intriguing. He's, and his, his story is just absolutely amazing. Like his life and his... Oh, oh it's all oh, bullshit. Yeah, oh. it's all bullshit. You gotta be very careful with Goethe. He, he talks complete bullshit. He's just, he's just taking you on a ride. But the, the, he had all sorts of stories like the they had all the, the he's he lets you in on information and often like secret information but he does it so that you can read the book at many levels and if you just take the story which is what most new age people do they read the story and then go oh Gurdjieff went with this group he went across the Gobi Desert and they took all these sheep and then they mixed the sheep with sand and fed them to the other sheep and that's how they crossed the desert until there was only like one sheep left. And then they just made it across. And it's like, you can't, you know, slaughter sheep, grind them up and feed them to other sheep dudes. <laughs> he's he's out of taking the piss. But you see, what he was saying is that that was the group. He's leading you in to that group that he was in. So it gives you lots of hints about hidden stuff if you're not a, a dipshit. But anyway, the, the, the school that I was in, uh, trace their line directly from Gurdjieff. So they've got a lot of that kind of kind of stuff. But even even the layered brain stuff uh, is uh, leans leans on. He he did Man with Three Brains or something like that. Belzebub's Tales to His Grandson, and he comes up with a lot of stuff which is close to the Alien Cortex. That, that's and, the one, the Tales to His Grandson, that I used to see on my father's. A bedside table, and I was kind of wondering what this mystery, and I couldn't understand those writings. I was looking at, it, I was like, "What on earth is he reading? Like, what is this?" And because the beginning is telling you basically, uh, you shouldn't be reading this anyway. You know, it's like yeah. telling you what the fuck are you doing reading this? First, you have to start in order. You can't start with this. You have to go back to the other books. And it's like an arg. It's like, it's telling you, yeah. uh, you know, you're he in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. He was doing an arg with dance and stuff, but he, he, he broke people's ego down. He did the same thing in the military. You break people's ego down and put them up and stuff. But he would do stuff like, um, hand round a plate so take it like after dinner he would hand round a plate full of money and he would say to all his disciples he'd say like here you know take something but they'd all be coins and then there'd be like a 50 50 dollars or something hundred dollar note and then everybody you know they all were good disciples so they all took the smallest coin or something and then and then uh, i think they one once there was this, this little little guy and, and he just went like, fuck it, took the $100 note. And then Gurdjieff looked at him with a little twinkle in his eye because he said like, yeah, th that was the right guy. He said he, he wanted the, the, he was looking for the person that would take the hundred, $100, uh, $100 because, you know, they were, they were beyond the stage of ego. So you, you can see there's a subtle ego that says you have an ego of, of humility and then you don't take the, the, the money. So, so what the little guy proved was that he didn't have an ego because he knew that you're supposed to take the little one and you know, fuck it, take the, which is more honest. Anyway, subtle stuff. <laughs> uh, and or one of the things that Gurdjieff said was there's only so much gold leaf to go around. So if you go now and look at those, there's still, uh, those houses and stuff, they're still in France where, where Gurdjieff was. If you go to them, you'll find they have no knowledge. They're just going through the motions. They, Gurdjieff did a lot of dance and a lot of moves. And they're still doing them, but they're cargo culting. They, don't, they can't tell you why they're doing those moves. They're just doing it because the master kind of taught them and they become formulaic and they've, they've lost it. Now, Gurdjieff himself said that, that you know, each leader like, like Gurdjieff, is, has so much gold leaf, the way we're saying, is so much kind of consciousness to spread around, so much wisdom and stuff to spread around a certain number of people. And but that's, that's the genesis of religion, isn't it? That's the yeah, genesis they, of they, religion. There are religions yeah. now, and the same yeah. thing happened to, to, to the cult I was in. When people ask, you know, what cult were you in, I, I hesitate to tell them because 
I know what they're going to do and they're going to go and research it. Yeah, well, it's okay if they're just researching it to research me. But what's dangerous is they will go and join it and say like, look, if, if you one of those guys don't go and join the girl does in, I checked up on them for years and years and years. So after the guy who started at Lynn McLaren died in 1994, I, I went routinely to the schoolhouses and met people to just check up on them and see their spiritual state. And it went down and down and down. And then you go to them now, they, they don't have any knowledge. They, they're teaching the old teachers. They don't, they've lost the wisdom behind the, the explanations. They don't have any insight. They're just going through the motions. And so you'll never reach enlightenment. <laughs> but they've guys. lost the connection. Yeah. And, and, that, and Gurdjieff warned, uh, warned uh, people about it. But they, they so, the level of consciousness is so low that they don't even know that, that they've lost it. You know. Anyway, so... Yeah. yeah, that kind of reminds me uh, at the end of that book, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, how, you know, they do the whole spiritual enlightenment thing, then Jonathan leaves, and then over time their cult loses touch with the what the spirit of it was. Yeah, just it just gets formulaic and religious and stuff. It's like, well, you know, you try and ferret out Jesus, from the Catholic Church is like a very, very remote figure. It's like what's left of Jesus in the Catholic Church is like fuck all virtually. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny too, because in that story, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, before he left, he said, Do not let them make me into a god, and that's exactly what they fucking did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Anyway, the, the, that, that whole side of things is an important part for Faulty, and I get the impression, it, you know, that's all new stuff. It's like, I, I don't think he understands any of that uh, part. So, got a long way to go. Sure. Well, anyway, okay, so no, well, I guess that's it, unless anybody's got any other questions. Okay, well let's let's pause and just go out with a with a bang. <laughs> oh full still. Come to a sense of awareness. Give up everything, have no attachments. No goals, no aim. Sacrifice anything that you might want to cling to and let it go. Om Paramatmane Namah There we go. Let it be in the hands of the gods. All right. See you guys later. See ya. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank happy you. Fourth. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> yeah, you. Happy fourth. Happy fourth.